So it turned out the reason why we're not seeing the button uh, when I load the tool is because actually I used the wrong type uh, of class uh, for the property set. I used editor scriptable interactive tool property set. I did that by going and clicking on uh, edit utilities, edit utility in the blueprint, and then I searched property set in here uh, and select the, selected the only option. Um, but it turns out what I should have done instead is gone up to blueprint class and searched property set in here and then chosen the, not the editor scriptable interactive tool property set, just the regular scriptable interactive tool property set. Not very clear, uh, kind of surprising, um, but uh, I just learned something new. So I'm not going to name this for the time being. Um, I'm just going to go into the pathfinding tool and I'm going to make sure that I target that new blueprint that I created. We're going to go into the new blueprint and create that custom event. And we're gonna say uh, load or yeah, load HDA, let's call it for the time being. And then we're going to do the same thing. So we're gonna do event dispatch. So dispatch load HDA. Okay, so we're gonna call that dispatch. So we now have set up our button. Um, we're gonna turn on call in editor, compile and save. And now if we go and actually click on the tool, we're going to see that we get that load HDA button. So that part is working at least. The next thing that we need to set up is that BGO file variable that we had in our previous property set. So we need to go and add a variable, make sure that it's public, make it be of type file path. We're gonna call this BGO file. Okay, so compile and save, run the tool. We can now see the file. Uh, and then the last thing that we need to go and do is just go and basically replace any references uh, to this property set landscape splines uh, inside of our tool. I think that we're pretty much done. Oh yeah, I just need to get rid of this as property set landscape splines. No, let's keep the, no, yeah, I need to get rid of both of those. There we go. So we're gonna get rid of all of this. And then uh, you can see we get some errors because we need to plug in the new reference uh, some, some places in this tool. But before we do that, let's just go ahead and delete the, uh, the old property set. Uh, let's just actually go ahead and save everything and then we can delete it. I'm surprised that we're still seeing some references. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the undo history. Uh, da -da -da -da. There we go. Now hopefully it will let me delete it. No, it still thinks that there's some references in memory to this thing. That's rather annoying. Um, I'm gonna rename it deprecated and then I'm just going to call the new one the correct name there we go maybe now I can delete it still doesn't want me to delete it so I think I'll have to close and reopen Unreal to delete that thing another weird Unreal peculiarity there so let's go into our tool and let's now do the same thing we did before where we cast to the property set landscape splines not the deprecated one okay then we're going to right click promote that to the variable we're gonna rewire in the bind event. And then over here, where we grab the file path to set the string parameter, we're gonna grab our new reference. We're going to get BGO file. So we have to delete that. And then we can break that file path down. When I hit compile, we should see that we don't get any errors, but we, if we do, it means I've forgotten something. It's because this bind event to dispatch load file uh, is now referencing an event that no longer exists because we changed the name. And I've also not hooked up the target. So let's grab that property set, let's bind uh, event to dispatch load HDA and wire that in to instantiate. Okay, so there was a little bit of debugging there. Um, although that might've been a little bit confusing to watch, maybe it, hopefully it gave you some additional context about how we debug things in blueprints uh, if you're new to blueprints. Um, so there's always a silver lining and I'm always uh, more of a half full kind of guy. Um, so let's, let's move on from there and if everything now works correctly, we have our, I'm gonna close that deprecated property set. We have our load HDA uh, event, which we can click on the button to call. That's going to call uh, this event, event instantiate HDA inside of our tool. And inside of the tool, what's gonna happen is it's gonna check if there's a valid Houdini session. If there isn't, it will create one. Then it's gonna wait a frame, and then it's going to try to instantiate the digital asset, and then it's gonna try and set the parameter on the digital asset. So let's see what happens. We minimize. We go to our scriptable tools mode. I'm gonna to click on splines, okay? And then I'm gonna go ahead and pick the BGO file that I want to load. There we go. And then I'm gonna hit load HDA. And some things have happened. We can see that the BGO uh, was finished instantiation, the BGO import. And we've now got this Houdini digital asset in our scene. And if we look inside of the parameters, we see that actually the geometry file has not been set. 
Okay, so some things are not working. Um, why could this be? Uh, let's have a little look at the uh, tool and see if we can figure things out. So to give you a little bit of context about why this isn't working, I'm gonna throw down another node, uh, which is similar to instantiate asset, but kind of gives us a little bit more information and context. And that is called process HDA. So what the process HDA function is going to do is it's going to instantiate the node and then it's gonna automatically run it. And you can see that we've got a whole load of execution pins happening sort of one after the other coming out of this node. And these are the different stages that the, uh, the, the digital asset is going through. Uh, and it sort of gives us the ability to run blueprint logic after each stage is completed. So pre-instantiation is before the, the digital asset sort of exists in the scene. Uh, and then we can say after the digital asset's been created, uh, we can do some stuff. Uh, then sort of after it's cooked, before it's baked, uh, and then after it's baked as well. So we have all these different things. And these these sort of like, um, these are latent uh, actions that we can, we can create. That means they happen at different times. This instantiate asset, on the other hand, doesn't give us any context about when the instantiation has actually completed. The way that this works in blueprints is it's going to instantiate the asset and immediately after it starts instantiating the asset, it's going to try and set the parameter, but it's unable to set the parameter if the instantiation has not already been completed. So we really want to try and find this post instantiation event uh, if it's at all possible. Now, I don't like using the process HDA function because it's kind of monolithic and it does a whole lot of stuff altogether. Um, so I'd prefer to continue using the instantiate asset. So how can we work with this? Well, if you remember, we've already set up a button, uh, which is a, a button that is an event that calls an event dispatcher. And we're able to bind a new event <laughs> to when that previous one was called using the bind event dispatch load HDA function that we did here. And we can actually do something pretty similar on the instantiate asset uh, from Houdini. So if we drag out of the return value here and we search for bind, you're going to see that we get a whole load of a bind event to uh, things. And if we throw down the process HGA once more, you can see that we have pre-instantiation, post-instantiation, etc. And actually, if we do the bind, we have the same exact set of options, post, post bake, post cook, post instantiation. And it's this third option here that we want. We want to bind an event to happen once this digital asset has been instantiated. Okay. And the event that we want to happen is we want to set the string parameter, okay? So we're going to get the asset that's been instantiated or being instantiated. And we're gonna say when this has finished instantiation, okay? So this is the reference and this is the execution pin. Then we're going to do some stuff. And those things we're going to do is we're going to do set parameters, okay? So instantiate the asset listen for when the instantiation is completed. When it's completed on the asset, we're going to set the parameters, okay? So there we go. And now let's go back and load our tool once more. We're going to pick our BGO file, unskip splines, and we're gonna click load HDA, okay? All right, now two things are worth pointing out here. The first one is that it finished the instantiation successfully as it did previously. But now we have two asset actors in our scene, which is not desirable. We have the result of the first cook where the geometry file path has not been set successfully. And we have the result of our second cook where we can see that indeed that geometry file uh, string parameter has been set successfully. So that worked, but we've kind of created a bit of a mess in our scene. So let's talk now about how we can avoid creating too many digital assets, manage, managing the lifetime of the digital asset procedurally through blueprints. Okay, so we're gonna exit the tool. We're gonna go ahead and delete the two BGOs like so, and we're gonna jump back inside of our blueprint. All right, so we've created a digital asset and the way that I want this to work is that when I exit the tool, when I complete working in the tool, I actually want the digital asset to be sort of cleaned up and removed, okay? So in order to do that, I first am going to need a reference to the digital asset. So just like I did when I created a reference to the property set so that I was able to access the parameters of the property set over here, I'm going to right click on the instantiated asset and we're gonna promote that to a variable as well, okay? And we're going to call this the HDA wrapper. I'm gonna rewire my nodes like so. 
okay? And now we can see that I have this HDA wrapper, wrapper variable that I can access anywhere else inside of the blueprint, assuming that it exists. And if I pull a pin out of the HDA wrapper, I'm gonna search for remove. We don't find anything specifically Houdini related, so I'm gonna search delete. And finally, we find what we're looking for. We have delete loaded asset, but this is an Unreal native function. And we have delete instantiated asset. And we can see that this is under the Houdini public API heading. Now it's easy to get confused here because we can also, oh no, we actually can't destroy. So, okay. But it's easy to get confused here because if we use delete loaded asset, what this is, this is really intended to work on assets in the content browser um, rather than a specifically like a Houdini sort of digital asset type object. It's actually working inside of the Unreal context. Delete instantiated asset, on the other hand, is going to delete the Houdini asset actor in the scene, and it's also going to remove kind of Houdini's own internal representation of the digital asset. And this is very important because when we ran the Houdini session, we're actually worrying up kind of a, a session of Houdini in the background. And if we just delete the actor in the scene, but we don't deal with that version of the asset that's running inside of the Houdini session, we're going to end up uh, with lots and lots of uh, digital assets sort of in that background Houdini session, which can cause a lot of instability and eventually crashes. So this is important to note that you need to use the delete instantiated asset. Another thing that you might try that's not the sort of correct route to go down is if you pull off of the HDA wrapper and search uh, asset actor, we can get the Houdini asset actor, which is the actual unreal actor in the scene that represents this digital asset and we could try to run the destroy actor on it. And again, this isn't the correct path to go down because this is going to just destroy the unreal representation of that digital asset, not going to destroy the sort of Houdini representation that's actually doing kind of all of the heavy lifting. And so we'll end up destroying, having a clear scene uh, in Unreal, but the Houdini session is gonna get clogged up and eventually kind of quite unstable. Okay, so I thought that was, I ran into that and I was, I was sort of unsure why this whole system was not behaving very uh, well, it was quite buggy. It just turned out it's because I hadn't understood the importance of deleting things correctly. Okay, so we have the ability to delete our digital asset, but when are we going to call it? Well, we've already called some behavior on event script startup, and it's logical that if we want to do things when the script ends, that there should be an event called on script shutdown, and there it is. Okay, so, I'm gonna wire that in there, compile and save. And then we're going to go and click on our spline tool. We're gonna to go ahead and click load HDA. You can see that it's created that BGO, it's instantiated it. And now if we hit complete, it's going to close or remove that uh, BGO uh, that was created. However, it's still not quite right because if I click load HDA, load HDA, load HDA, we're able to load in multiple of these HDAs uh, sort of uh, you know, over time, which isn't really what we want. So let's go and modify the behavior of our tool once more. Uh, whereas at the moment, we're sort of explicitly calling this function uh, that's going to create the digital asset. Actually, what I want to do is I don't want the button to create the digital asset. I just want the button to cook the digital asset, okay? So rather than uh, the way it currently works, where it's actually generating HDA when I press the button, I actually want the button press to do the equivalent of just hitting the recook button uh, down here, okay? Which means that I need to create the digital asset at a different point in time. And that point, point in time is just going to be when the script uh, starts to run, okay? So we're gonna move this logic over here and we're going to pull the uh, this pin out. So after we've bound some events, we're just going to go over here and uh, yeah, and run the instantiation. And then what we're going to do is previously, where we're setting the parameters uh, after the button has been pressed, this time, the way it's going to work is we're going to set the parameters uh, right after the cook button has been pressed. So what we're going to do is actually just disconnect this from here. We may still want to use this for some other things later on. And then we're going to go and we can actually de delete. Yeah, we can get rid of the instantiate HDA event. We can wire in set parameters instead. Okay, that's not wanting to do that. So we're gonna just delete that. And we're gonna go custom event set or even recook. Let's call this recook now. I'm gonna wire recook in. And this time, because we know that by the time we press the button, 
the HGA has already been instantiated. In fact, let's just do a little test. Let's just do a little test. So we'll call this uh, post instantiation. And what we're going to do is then we're going to create another variable of type Boolean is instantiated. So this is kind of a clean, more hygienic way of setting things up. And we're going to set is instantiated to be true only after this event happens. Okay. So by default, it's false. And then after the instantiation happens, it's set to true. So we can now just do a little check on recook, which says, is this HDA currently instantiated? If not, do nothing. Uh, but if it's true, then we can start to set the parameters. Okay, so just not strictly necessary, but probably a good hygiene to do that. And then uh, what we can also do is, uh, what we need to do, sorry, is actually grab that reference to the wrapper, like so, so that we're actually, we know which digital asset we want to set the parameter on. And then finally, we can go down and call that recook function. And if you remember, at, right at the start, I said that Houdini can kind of lock up if you try and do too many operations uh, simultaneously or just right after the other. So we're going to throw in a little delay until next tick as well uh, between the setting of the parameters and the cooking of the digital asset. All right. So now what we would expect to happen is that we get the same behavior that we had previously when we loaded the digital asset in the scene. We hit the recook button. Uh, sorry, we hit the recook button down in the parameter interface and we get our paths on the terrain. So if we run our tool, okay, uh, we can see it's currently called load HDA, which is not the correct name. So actually, let's just go and tidy that up. So we go to our property set. I'm going to call this now recook, just like we did. I'm going to call this dispatch recook. So it matches the actual things that are happening under the hood. You can see that this has already been named correctly now inside of the tool, bind event to a dispatch recook, and then it calls a recook event in here. So we've run our tool. We're going to go and grab a reference to the splines, and let's just go ahead and hit recook. And look at that. It's generated the paths uh, just like it would have done if we were actually working with the tool inside of the interface over here. And then if I go ahead and hit complete, oh, it deletes the paths in the scene. And that's good in a way <laughs> because it means that the the paths are actually tied to the digital asset, but we want to make sure that they, the changes stick around after we've made our modifications, okay? So let's go ahead and wire this up. Actually, let's go back into our digital tool once more. So the last thing we're going to go and do is after the recook has happened uh, on the instantiate asset, we're just going to enable auto bake. And that's going to ensure that when we delete the uh, the digital asset from the scene, the, the actual baked output remains. So we go ahead and test that. Press Shift 9 to open up the tool once more. I'm going to load uh, the correct asset. I'm going to hit Recook. And now you can see if we hit Complete, it leaves that spline in the scene. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, we've done like the, the sort of the bare bones of, of setting up our own scriptable tool around the digital asset. And you might be wondering what's the point. Well, the point was, if you remember, that if we go back to Houdini, and we provide uh, a slightly different curve input, like so. Oops, like so. Save out that new curve. Go back to Unreal. Load in the new splines and hit Recook again. The issue was that we end up with two splines instead of kind of like a new uh, overwritten spline network. Um, so if we make modifications, they're not actually getting propagated to Unreal. So that's that was the whole point, and that's what we're going to look at next.